We have two speakers will be on stage. Our next speakers are Mr. Marcos Lehto, founding partner of Joint Idea, and Ms. Gerald Charchler, founder of Insight Consoles. Please welcome. So I'd like to start by asking a little question. We've had quite a few, especially with the session with Berk and Usam. Thank you. Uh, some discussions about what it means to be a human in the future and the future in general. And I just wanted to ask all of you here, how do you view the, fu how do you view the future? Are there those of you here that are fearful about the future? Would you put up your hands if you think the future is going to be worse than the present? Are you scared of it? No. One person. Come on, be fair, be realistic. Does it frighten you? Does well, it keep you up at night? Okay, a few more. How many of you are super optimistic about the future, thinking that things are going to be way better in the future than they are currently? Wow, nice. That's more optimistic Wonderful. group than pessimistic. <laughs> that's a good crowd. Because what we're seeing on a global level, especially in countries in the Western world, where things have really changed quite a bit these days, is that people are really anxious about the future. Um, people feel very dislocated from their friends, from their families, from their colleagues. Work has actually become the leading source of unhappiness and misery in the world. And it's the thing that connects us all as human beings. And actually about 90% of people are actively disengaged with the work they're doing. And you know, over those 90%, 20 people, 20% 20 of people are actually uh, violently opposed to the work they're doing. So the work is really a, is a key thing in terms of uh, disrupting the future. Uh, we feel that there's very little life balance between work and life. This is In Turkey, it's the case of zero work-life balance. I'm not sure how that is in the countries that you're also coming from, but these are some of the biggest issues of our times. And let's face it, there's a lot going on around us, actually. Politics, pretty well everywhere these days, are a huge question mark. Where are we going? Who's leading us? Nobody really knows these days. The climate also is an issue that's impacting all of us and for many years you know we've been trying to save the world and you know everybody's pushing in that direction but truthfully the world doesn't need us to save it we have to save ourselves which is even a bigger issue how can we as a human species survive with the things that are taking place around us our identity is also open to question these days a child born today ex can expect to live to 124 years old and most of us here are going to be living longer than any of our ancestors actually did and we don't know how to get old because nobody actually taught us how to do that. And there's also more of us on this planet than there used to be. And how we can live with such uh, population and such diversity is also something we've never ever done before. Nothing we were taught in school has taught us how to actually handle all the things in, in front of us. And of course there's the technological issue. Technology is moving at an exponential speed changing everything in our path. Most of us went to university or studied to learn something and as we just learned a little while ago even the cognitive field is being taken over more or less uh, faster or more slowly by artificial intelligence and other very disruptive exponential technologies. So it's making a crisis of meaning in our own lives. Who are we? Why are we here? And we really really don't have too many places that we can draw upon to give us the answers to these types of things. And a lot of this is related to how fast things have really changed over the past hundred or so years. So if we look at this very, very quickly, we can see that in 1900, things like the landline telephone, cars, electricity, radio, refrigerators, these were the things that actually have shaped our complete life story over the past hundred years. They were invented nearly a hundred years ago, but they're the things that we still are framed by. Our daily behaviors and patterns are governed by those. And between the 1940s and pretty well the 1960s when of course we were recovering from world wars and the other things that used to happen very frequently we've had a bunch of these new disruptive technologies that are following this exponential curve where you know there was nothing and all of a sudden within a very quick period of time there's universal adoption of these things so we see it most clearly from our mobile phones which we all have our smartphones which have the world's knowledge in them and we're at the beginning all at the beginning of this curve that is really disrupting where things will be going from this point. And we can look at this a couple of different ways, you know, we're either this caterpillar that is at the bottom of the screen that you can see right here, just kind of getting used to this and kind of taking the first steps. Uh, and with all of these enabling technologies that we have, we may well become 
a butterfly. We heard the story of the eagle, which is also a great analogy for this, but we have to learn how to fly. And this is starting to shape the way we do everything. So business models are starting to shift from a strict focus on profit to also purpose. You know, what more can we do than make money? How can we get away from hierarchies where we had to be uh, managed and governed by fear to actually being independent, decentralized networks that we can all function as individual human beings who are empowered rather than controlled. How do we move from planning? You know, when, when we think these days into the future to have a six-month plan or a one-year plan or a five-year plan, forget about it. It's impossible. Things are changing too quickly. We need to look at our lives as a laboratory and all of the work that we're doing is a laboratory with no clear end in sight, but we have to wake up every day appear and keep on experimenting. And we're also moving from privacy to complete transparency. So as we look at blockchain, other types of decentralized uh, technologies that are digitized, we're moving into a very transparent period. As Usal just mentioned a bit earlier, if we don't believe this exponential curve to be true, which we don't have to, we just have to look at how the way the world is working. Five years ago, six years ago, as we saw, all of the world's largest companies were pretty well based in the field of banking or oil. And now we see everybody, all the world's largest companies, four of which have pushed beyond a trillion dollars for the first time, um, are all technology companies. So we're living at this period where we have this very delicate balance between exponential technology and what we call exponential humanity. And only by going deeper into ourselves are we going to be able to take any advantage of these technologies that are currently disrupting everything around us. So when we actually look at this question of are we fearful of the future or are we not, it comes down to really looking at it in this kind of way. So do we look backwards and say, oh, the good old days, things were much better then? Or can we look forward and say that there's something that we haven't experienced yet and we can get really excited about it? You know, what, how do we actually capture the potential of that? Because the future is actually already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And the people that are actually making this future happen have very different values than the values that we, and me being 45, uh, probably similar, I guess, to most of the people in this room in, in that generation. People of the future, the generations coming up, want meaningful experiences, more than stuff. You know, less stuff, low sumerism is the way of the future. People will be making more, less money also, but the focus will be on more real value, not wasting so much money. In terms of careers, a child born today can expect to have about 16 to 20 different jobs throughout their career. So long gone are the days of you know, a person just doing one thing and you know, expecting to do that until retirement and then start living. You know? That model of the world is no longer applicable. So we want freedom, we want mobility. We don't want a 30-year mortgage, a 40-year mortgage and being locked into that kind of situation. And this is also super important for the wedding industry. You know, what, will people get, be getting married as much? Do we want to believe in till death do us part? Is that really something that we can achieve with so much disruption taking place around us? And it really comes down to this issue of us being human beings rather than just human doings, you know, constantly chasing something. So this is impacting the way that we're living. We're now moving from a, a world which over the past maybe 20 or 30 years, especially here in Turkey, has gone from something that was, you knew, you, you knew your neighbor, and the story used to be you don't buy a house, you buy a neighbor, but now we're living in a situation and in, in a time where Many people are living like this, where people don't know their neighbors and maybe even have no interest to know their neighbors. But down the road, we need to regain that human connection. So we see, I've also been working in, the past, in real estate for the past 20 years as a developer, and our dream is to build communities like this, which are self-generating, where people get to know one another, they eat together, they connect with one another, they, they grow old together. Uh, we're moving from work environments, where, which were cubicles, to Basically, we're always working, no matter where we are, and we can customize and personalize all of our work environments. In terms of our meeting environments, we're going from massive packed halls in a kind of one-way dialogue to something that really needs to have more purpose, and that can take place nearly anywhere, even in a hotel washroom. And what really brings us together is um, the fact that none of us know where things are going, and it's up to all of us to come together to figure out what's going to become of each of us. So this is one of the core issues that we're facing is our, our own work and is the founder of a company called Joint Idea, which is a kind of experiment into new ways for human beings to collaborate with one another. How can we bring our ideas together as synergistic 
um, things versus simply being transactions that we all benefit, that somebody doesn't have to lose for somebody else to gain. And we have an education program called LifeWorks Labs, which we're trying to bring this way of thinking to many of the world's largest corporations, both locally and internationally. And we have a group of people that we're not hiring, but are together with us as collaborators, and we call them the Love Mafia. So um, how do we spread love and humanity in the world with urgency at a time when it's needed the most? And we're part of an, uh, of an important initiative internationally that takes place around Web Summit, which you maybe know is the world's largest technology conference, which brings in around 70,000 people per year in Lisbon. And as a pop-up to that, we have started an initiative called the House of Beautiful Business, which invites all the people who are at the driver's seat of technology, you know, making algorithms, making these disruptive technologies, and saying, hey, who's in charge here? Is it venture capitalists? Is it the computer scientists who are you know, working remotely somewhere? How do we bring in humans? How do we bring in philosophers, artists? Uh, when I said humans, I meant humanists, um, designers, people who, are, who spend their lives concerned about the future of humanity, to sit at the same table to actually find ways that we can make technology more human-centric versus serving the very few. And this is also where we came in contact with Jeren, yeah. who's been sitting here patiently as I'm speaking the whole time. <laughs> so Jeren is um, also a Love Mafia member. Yes. Uh, but apart from that, I think the ultimate connector that I've ever met in my entire life. Thank you. And we work on a basis which we call the human algorithm, which is about a person's own filter and then coming to you and then saying, you, you should trust this person because I also trust this person. Yes. And it's what Fawth was also mentioning earlier, that you know, if we go beyond the transaction-based nature of every business and say that, okay, it's good to make business, but it's better to make friends because that means exactly. you can do it over and over. Yeah. And everybody you've introduced us, Jaden, has, has always... Has been like family. Has been like family. Yes, that's right. And the thing about it is like, um, you know, we're talking about gathering and we're talking about why we gather and I always go back to my childhood and because uh, I lived in eight countries I lived in three different cont continents and uh, you know throughout my childhood uh, living in completely different cultures and the, we're talking about cultural interconnectivity in this event as well um, I felt joy when there was a gathering I felt at home when we had you know people at home or when we were at a cocktail or when we were at a restaurant so the the, the point of coming together with people and emotionally connecting with people gave me joy because this if you think about it if we go back in uh, our human uh, uh, nature um, we've ha we have it in our DNA. Since the first humans, uh, you know, after a very hard day of a hunting in, with hunter-gatherers, they would come together around the fire and they would share the food that was hunted that day. Um, they would uh, share also their experiences, so it was a way of storytelling, it was a way of passing on experiences to each other, and it was a way of survival. People, as they gathered, as they came together, they became stronger and they, that increased their uh, probability of survival. So if you look at why we gather today, um, um, it's kind of like the same thing. The how has changed, but the reason, the innate nature of it hasn't really changed. We're here to share a story. All of us here are to share, are listening to each other to uh, learn from each other, to learn from experiences, and to connect. Um, however, the way we connect is the big question mark because the way we connect has changed and our dear friends uh, back in Ustal has talked about it, you talked about it, with these disruptive technologies that are coming and the ADD kind of a mindset that we're facing today, um, the how has to be very innovative because if we bring people together in huge areas uh, and you know that I do every year the Bosphorus Summit, which is the biggest event in Turkey, and I'm a founding member of it, and we bring together, I don't know, thousands of people from uh, around 60 countries every year uh, in Istanbul. Um, and people do come. People do come every year, and there's a loyalty. And so loyalty is not the issue there because they come because the president is there, because ministers are there, or because ministers from around the world are there. But how do they connect emotionally is the question. 
Well, that's really it, isn't it? Because we live at a time where, you know, the biggest problem is, well, this isn't it, but let's say it's a phone, which we're looking at 150 to 650 times per day, which is crazy. You know, it's something that we do more than anything else, pretty yeah. much. And, you know, you can easily bring people into a room. You know, you can gather people, but how do you actually get them to participate, really be there? to feel included, to feel a part of it? Yes. The same thing happens, and you very well mentioned about architecture. You've been a developer, I've been a developer, so we worked with architects and we know what it's like to develop from, from scratch, from land. And uh, most architects will impose upon the land. They'll come with a structure, they'll create this beautiful, uh, you know, um, um, style or, or, or design in the heads and they'll impose it upon the land. Whereas you have, and I worked with this amazing, please check him out, he's called Fernando Caruncho. He's an amazing landscape designer. He's the best in the world. And we have him in our project at the Kempinski in Bodrum. And uh, what he does is he works from the land outward. So he looks at the land and he studies the land, he looks at the nature, he looks at the colors and builds it from there. So the same thing has to happen with the events. You have to build it from the very core of it, from the, na the very nature of it, from th the story that you want to tell, from the message that you want to give out. If it's a couple, what's their love story? You have to build it from there. So the format has to change. You have to unformat the format. So if you stick to the same things of like, okay, you know, um, uh, the decoration, the logistics, uh, you know, the beautiful hotel, the amazing food, that's not enough. That's that's not a good way of making an event. You're never going to achieve a connectivity through that. How do you engage the people? How do you make sure they share the same story that you're telling throughout the event? That is the core issue here. And I think we kind of achieve that with the House of Beautiful Business versus the Bosphorus Summit. Yes. Uh, because we do it in a way that people um, give their opinions before they come. So the participation starts before the event actually happens. Such an important thing. I mean, this goes down to many different types of philosophies, but the Japanese also believe that, you know, everything is in the presentation and ultimately in the, in the kind of build up to something. Mm. So when you think of events, I mean, if you can get people engaged well before they arrive, that they have this kind of sense of expectation, which may start even months prior to something actually happening, you know, the event itself then becomes less of an issue and it's the kind of collective wisdom and the kind of um, shared um, sensation maybe that you might have as a result of that. And it's so easy to achieve. I mean, it, it can be as simple as, like for instance, um, in an RSVP of an invitation that you send out, if it's a wedding, let's say, it can be as simple as choose the song you would like to be played then people feel like an ownership to it. Or if, if it's a logo of an event, you can tell people to choose the color of it. Or you can make sure people beforehand ask questions to the speakers. So these are very easy ways of engaging people beforehand. And with technology, that's going to be even easier. Like you have Leap Motion, uh, a company in the United States, they have a, a virtual reality. And with this um, technology that they have, people can actually, with their hands, uh, change the the space or the structure of an event venue so you have to be able to engage people through the facilities that technology provides and take it to the next level the technology is so amazing from that perspective yeah. the key then with, with these type of technologies again is that even if you're able to do these remotely I mean can you imagine a conference where people are just connecting through VR or coming through you know from a, a virtual type of environment mm -hmm then it puts an even bigger pressure on the events where people are coming together face to face to achieve even more. Yes. And you know, that really means what is the, what is, what does it mean to be human? And it comes down to this issue of our own identity and why is it that we're coming together? And it's about creating, I think, beauty. I think that's a key word, you know, beauty is a key word. And, um, um, they say that if in the face of beauty, you transform people. A, f a person who faces beauty, even if he doesn't want to, is transformed forever. So if you're able to create this beauty and harmony throughout an event, then you're, you're transforming people, even if they don't realize it. When they go back home, they've already transformed. So it's, a, it's the sense of creating an emotional connection uh, and how to do it is the big question. And I think the other issue is how do you do something like that at scale? And there's a 
there's a, I don't know if all of you might be familiar with this, but in the world of development, we've come across this uh, issue of what we call the Dunbar number. And it's founded by an Oxford evolutionary anthropologist, uh, Robin Dunbar, with the idea that as human beings, actually, we can't even have relationships with more than 150 people. It's just our brain begins to melt, you know, at that point, because we're only, if you think of what it means to have friendships with 150 people, that means remembering birthdays. His ultimate example of this is that if you show up at a bar or at a dinner without your wallet, would the people that are sitting at that table or around you happily pay for you and say, that's okay, it's not a problem. So you might imagine people like that in your life. And for most of us, it's maybe, I don't know, five to 25 people, something like that. Is a theoretical maximum, it's 150, which comes from our primate ancestral kind of uh, evolution. We used to live in smaller tribes. Now we live in a world that is dominated by you know, scales that are well beyond us. And when we get into that kind of beyond human scale feeling in the world of, you know, buildings, real estate, could be hotels, shopping malls. If you spend a day in a place where you're overwhelmed, where there's more than, you know, the natural comfort zone that we have, we feel overwhelmed. You get the sense of mall head or a kind of event hangover of some kind, you know, that you've just, you know, you, you really can't process all that information. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, of course, we have to meet in large scale events, you know, in the thousands even. So in your view, how do you kind of, how do you deal with that? Well, I mean, for instance, at the Bosphorus Lovers, what I try to do is, by the way, it's very difficult to uh, make changes because I'm the only woman as a founding member of this huge event and I'm the youngest one. And I, usually my ideas are not as effective as the older generation's ideas. So you have to be disruptive in that matter as well. So my idea is always to reverse engineering and uh, the idea is to uh, create kind of like a closer groups within this huge scale event. So when you create clo uh, smaller groups with smaller workshops, you create groups of like 10 or 7 or 15 that kind of have a shared um, uh, experience. They can be going to a different restaurant together, or they can be doing a workshop together, or they can be uh, creating maybe a game together, or, or um, have a uh, one idea that they want to share with the rest of the bigger crowd together. So that, that kind of connects them beyond the event itself. The gamification, I think, is a great innovation that we're starting to see happen more and more often. Yeah. And I think that technology is a kind of enabler of that, can make you know things possible that we couldn't even imagine previous to that. But you mentioned something else actually and I think that this is something which is key to the world that can be impacted from the people from all of you that are here today is that when you can gather with a purpose where you actually stand for something and you don't just gather for the sake of gathering or we're having a meeting because we're used to having meetings and you kind of resist the temptation to do that but you push it a bit harder and you actually say we're meeting for a specific reason which is possibly even a bit risky and I think what is fantastic about what I felt from here especially from the conversations of Fouad and actually echoed with everybody afterwards is that again it's not about you know transacting business it's really about making relationships and how might I call you know, you in a couple months time down the road at three o'clock in the morning say, you know, I need something from you. And, you know, exchanging these buddy favors, I like to call these actually. I mean, once you actually start to think and behave that way, business becomes a natural consequence of having deeper relationships. Mm -hmm. But again, most of us don't know how to have relationships. We were never taught how to do something like that. And I think that conferences, events, you know, the whole my sector, especially weddings, if, if, you know, the power of the group could be brought into play, you know, with the idea that we could all engage deeper. And it's not about, you know, the scale of it. It's not about making an event big or having more clients or having more sponsors. It's not about the scale. It's not about the more. It's about the meaning. What's the meaning that I want to convey as I do this event? What's the message that I want to give out? Uh, th that, if we, fo if we change our focus from the other, from the format to the unformat to the nature of it, I think any event c uh, can bring wonders. Um, even in weddings, I think, if you concentrate on the couple itself and not the format of the wedding, God knows what creative solutions will come out of it, you know? Because the format actually limits your creativity. And uh, the more we're ticking boxes, 
the more we're limiting ourselves. And in the future, if we're limited, we're going to die off. Yes. These kind of ritualized meetings, you know, there's a kind of formula for what we might call beauty. Mm -hmm. That, you know, it's a tech ch uh, checkbox, you know, did you get the flowers right? Was the lighting right? Was the cutlery right? Was all this done well? But beauty is actually, as they say, in the eye of the beholder. And, you know, how do we leave an, an event or that gathering with a sense of beauty that is internal, that we might not even fully explain? You know, there's a sense of love and magic in the It's in the authenticity. Yeah. It's sharing your truth. Whatever your truth is, is sharing that truth, sharing what's authentic to you, what's close to your heart. Bringing that outward it will, will make the huge uh, difference. And I think in the future, when we face, uh, uh, when we're face to face with technology, the more human we are, the more authentic we are, I think the more uh, we have a chance of survival. Yes. Well, the number one uh indicator of a long and happy and successful, maybe not successful in the classic sense, but success in terms of your life longer, yeah. is the quality of your social connections. And that's been proven time and time again in different parts of the world where, you know, people value the quality of intimate and human connection with the others around them. Mm -hmm. And that makes you live longer. Uh, absolutely. You know? And it makes your business more successful as well. Yeah. The more you have deeper connections with uh, your clients or with your network, the more they will go to you rather than the other because they trust you more. And they want that feeling. They don't they want really that care so much about yes, the other stuff, the decorative feeling. stuff. Then. Absolutely. Murat Bey, could I ask you to play the film that we were mentioning earlier? So this is just to give you a sense of what we mean by simplicity, by beauty, by harmony and nature. And, uh, you know, so we wanted to have a hint on how nature just flourishes. And it's so simple. It's not about complicating it. It's about keeping it more simple, keeping it more beautiful and keeping it more true. And you're a global citizen. I'm a global citizen yes. as well. Finnish Canadian. I've been living in twenty in Turkey for the past twenty years. I've done business in countless countries. I think all of you probably are also global citizens. And if we look at the world really as a garden, and if you look at your life as a garden, and if we look at every event and gathering as a garden, you know, we have the chance to do something that nothing else can actually do. And we all live at a time and I think that we all come from countries really uh, where politics I'm not going to say they're broken, but they're not going to achieve what we need for us as human beings. Companies also are not going to achieve for that, that for us unless we're the ones making those companies. And I think that the obligation is for us as human beings, when we gather in the events that you, know, you guys are doing the world over, that we go deeper and we actually start to solve problems and start to identify problems and maybe solve, solve them as well, that nobody else can. Governments can't, businesses can't, and it's up to us as the friends who are supporting one another. And uh, if we can make that the ethos and the purpose of our event, and you know whatever the occasion is to go down to that very core message, we'll be on to something. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to us.